So for the next interview, I want to bring out one of my most uh, talented colleagues at Recode, Eric Hesseldahl. And Eric is our guy who does enterprise. Eric? There he is. And so, er go, ahead. go ahead, you go ahead. Oh, so it's often said that pretty much every company that exists today is in some way a software company. And so one of the companies that uh, we we're kind of excited to have Paul Moritz with us today, who, uh, whose company Pivotal is kind of taking advantage of this trend. And so Paul, come on out. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Hey, Paul. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> So this morning, I was reading up another profile of, of, of Pivotal, and a, and, a, and a phrase kind of stuck with me. And it was, uh, and I don't know if it was you saying it or if it came from the conversation with the interview, but it, that you have to, companies have to rediscover their inner software developer <laughs> again. And that's basically what Pivotal is all about. So why don't you, is that an accurate description of what oh, Pivotal is about? Oh, uh, actually, it is very accurate. Uh, you know, Pivotal was created uh, just over two years ago now because a bunch of us believed that enterprises are going to have to do something different in the future to survive and, and prosper. And uh, there are two huge trends going on, which is uh, a complete remaking of the systems of engagements whereby enterprises reach their customers. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, is fundamentally changing. The, the, the era of spending vast amounts of money on advertising to drive the masses to you are passing. Instead, people are having to build these engaging and useful and compelling experiences, many cases delivered on a smart device, uh, to pull the customer in that way. Uh, and a lot of the disruptive companies today, as you guys know, don't spend huge amounts of money on advertising. Uber doesn't spend vast amounts right. of money in advertising. They build this experience that pulls you in. And on the other hand, there's this unfolding uh, internet of things uh, whereby you know, everything that's made from your socks to a jet engine is going to be attached to the internet and constantly dialing home. My, my socks uh, to the internet. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, uh, and to, to take advantage of that, uh, as well as these systems of engagement, companies need to learn how to kind of catch people or things in the act of doing something and affect the outcome. Mm -hmm. That requires not only new and different technology, but a different culture. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we have been speaking to that trend. And uh, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that it's almost a rising sense of panic <laughs> inside enterprises today as they are beginning to realize the depth of the transformation that's going on. Uh, can you, can you give me an example of that panic? I mean, sure. in, in, so, in that uh, way you'd probably end up describing some. Yeah, so it was uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, it, we were visited by one of the CEOs of the largest car companies in the world. Uh -huh. we, had, and, we had one uh, here. We had one here, yeah. <laughs> we had Mary Barber. Uh, it, it may have even been the same one, I'm not sure. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, I don't think it was. The, uh, and yes, they're worried about Tesla. <laughs> But in some senses, Tesla is a car company, and they can sort of figure out how to compete with them. What, in addition to that, is really exercising them is young people no longer view Wanting cars, buy cars yeah. uh, as an aspirational item. Instead, they want to belong to a car club, you know, that just provides transportation, which means That's that me. this I, I don't own a car. The whole system of engagement, of how you engage with your customer, is radically changing. And uh, the CEO was saying, "Look, I." got this magnificent team of people who get their jollies on analyzing the vibration in drive trains, et cetera. But I don't have the capability to engage with young people in a fundamentally different way. Uh, and for me, that's a cultural problem. Yes, there's technology that's going to be involved, but where do I come to and who do I work with uh, to help me build that new set of capabilities? And that, that's the vein that uh, we identified and have actually been able to so tap into. Walk us down that a little bit because I don't want the story to stop there in explaining what you do. Uh, you, that executive could have gone to a marketing agency or an advertising agency and said, help me connect with millennials. And that agency would have figured out, okay, you know, here are the YouTube channels they watch, here, here's, here are the, the you know, the, the 
things they read, places they go, and we will put the appropriate marketing and advertising around that. That's one thing, and maybe they are doing that too, but you're not doing, going to do that for we're them. Not doing so that. what are you going to do to connect well, them to Well, where we, we into that conversation is, is these companies like that car company are realizing that the app, quote unquote, is going to be as important as the car. Right. Uh, that the engagement doesn't start in the vehicle. <laughs> the engagement starts outside of the vehicle in a, in a variety of different ways. Right. Uh, and the ability to build that app as a compelling experience, a compelling, useful, real-time experience, they're realizing they not only need a new technological substrate to do that, but they need a different culture. <laughs> because, so when we put our company together, we did something a little bit unusual. Uh, we not only had the technical aspects, which is where I come from, you know, I'm a plumber by trade, I get my jollies out of uh, operating systems and things like that, but we realized that there was this cultural transformation that was gonna need it as well. So we built our company around a company called Pivotal Labs that we acquired, which is one of the, the most respected custom application development houses in Silicon Valley. Grew up writing uh, applications for many of the startup names, including several that you've had on stage here. Twitter was one. Twitter was one, uh, et cetera. Uh, and they have evolved a different way of doing product development, uh, trying to really not only do things quickly, but above all, get them right first time and really be able to go around that iteration loop of learning and adapting constantly. Is it, is it from Pivotal uh, well, Labs? So, go ahead. excuse me, Eric, so, uh, that's your capability, but again, you, you're going so, so to give we, these guys some software no, and that's no, going to solve no, their millennial what, problem? Uh, what's differentiating, differentiating about us is we go to them and say, look, we can write software for you, but what we really want to do is to write software with you. We want to essentially help you learn how to do this. So we're getting increasingly engagements now where companies come to us and say, look, we need to build a new innovation capability. We need a partner who can initially get us started on that journey, but above all, help us learn us how to do that themselves. Because if what you're talking about is the, the essential, critical, differentiating experience of your company, you can't outsource that to anybody. Uh, you can't buy it off the shelf from somebody. So you've got a whole generation of IT uh, over the last 25 years who thought that the right thing to do was to outsource everything, including paradoxically, in many cases, the first thing they outsourced was their application development capability. Now they're waking up and realizing that their competitors view product development and software development in particular as a critical advantage. So that's where the panic is coming from, because they're looking at this and saying, look, we, we just don't have this uh, in our, and it's not just a technical issue, it's just that we just don't have the people who know how to think that way. So we're increasingly doing what you can think of as build, operate, transfers for companies. So for instance, we're working with Humana, one of the largest healthcare companies, right. who came to their own realization that to be in healthcare these days, you need to be in wellness as well as illness. Yeah. And to be in wellness, you've got to be engaging with people, taking all the information from their watches, their Fitbits, their, their smartphones. And by definition, you're not going to be encountering them in the hospital <laughs> when they're well. Uh, so the system of engagement is changing. And they realized they needed to go on a journey to do that. And they looked at themselves and said, you know, we've got a bunch of guys who know how to run ERP systems. We don't know anything about how to do that, but it's gonna be a critical capability for us in the future. So we're helping them build an innovation uh, uh, capability. Doing the same thing here uh, in Los Angeles with CoreLogic, a big um, provider in the financial services space, et cetera. So that's one major piece of your business is the software development piece the build, what did you say, build? Build, operate, transfer. Build, operate, transfer. So you build it, help them build it, transfer it to them. Um, that's one big piece of your business. The second big piece of your business, you teased at it, is... Yeah, so what, what we say is, is you not only want to do product development, and I say product development because it's more than just software development, in a modern way, but you want to do it on a platform uh, that really does justice to that. You want to do it on a platform that takes full advantage of the cloud and the new data capabilities, but doesn't lock you into any particular cloud provider. Uh, so the sort so of it's very, Amazon, Azure, yeah, Azure. So the very loose analogy is that you can look at these modern infrastructure clouds like Amazon, et cetera, as kind of, these are the giant computers of the 21st century. Uh, but we don't want those necessarily to become highly proprietary environments where you get in there, you never get out. We need the moral equivalent of Linux 
for the cloud that allows you to write applications in a modern cloud-like way, but doesn't lock you into any particular model, either a public cloud or a private cloud or a hybrid cloud or whatever. And you need the data capabilities, particularly in the Internet of Things space, that take advantage of what the cloud uniquely does. And what the cloud does is, as a different to what the client server generation does is from a developer's perspective, it gives you access to a huge number of inexpensive machines and lots of cheap storage. You as a developer now, in, when you look at the cloud as an architecture as opposed to a place, you as a developer can say, look, I want a thousand machines to throw at my problem and I want them for the next 30 minutes and I'm gonna give them back to you. You could never have even begun to think about that in the client server uh, era. And, and that's what a lot of these big internet consumer companies like Google have been trading in. <laughs> They're trading in applications where you can take advantage of that. So we need to unlock that for enterprises as well. Right. And so... I'm doing that all, by the way, on an open source space. It, it, it sounds like you're basically a, a, a consultant in many ways. No, we're, we're, we're a, a company that is aiming to provide transformational capability to our customers, both on the culture as well as the technology side. So when, so you, when you engage our, with a company, do you, do you leave after a while? Yeah, so I, our permanent? perfect engagement would be to leave after a while having given them business capability, in other words, applications and the capability to develop new applications running on this new platform. Mm -hmm. And our long-term monetization is obviously comes from the underlying platform. Uh, but we realized that there was a huge sector of enterprises who weren't gonna get to, to quote unquote the cloud and new models of engagement and the Internet of Things unless something radical happened. Right. And the interesting thing is what we found is, is that CEOs, not so much CIOs, but CEOs are coming to this conclusion on their own. They're coming to the conclusion that the transformation that they're going to have to go on is going to require a new set of partners. They're not going to get this from the traditional system integrators who are kind of, you know, enterprises and system integrators bred each other as mirrors of each other. They're going to need to go somewhere else. Uh, and so that's why we have you know, head of a major car company spending time with us in San Francisco. Right. They, why doesn't IBM, why isn't it true that IBM does the same thing? Cultural transformations, Walt, as you and I know, are very hard to do. You yep. and I were talking about, you know, how we first met 20 or 25 years ago when I was at Microsoft and we right. were king of the hill then. And uh, these major shifts in the industry are not only technological shifts, but each of those technologies breeds a certain kind of person. Uh, you're successful because you're good at operating that kind of a model. And when a new model comes around, it's very, very hard to change. And that's why Pivotal is an interesting exper uh, experiment because in corporate governance, because we said, look, rather than try and do this inside an existing entity, let's spin it completely out. Let, let's uh, create an entity that doesn't have to worry about the legacy and can just lean into the future. <laughs> is, but you're not, are you an independent company? We're an independent company, completely independent company. Within our, the Federation of EMC. Well, we, our, our, our shares, 80% of our shares are owned by EMC and VMware, but 10% by General Electric, 10% by the employees. But all the employees have pivotal equity. They don't have EMC equity. <laughs> so we're incented to make pivotal successful. <laughs> So I was at the EMC shareholder meeting, and, and Joe Tucci spoke rather eloquently. You were there, too. I saw you. Um, and he said that this is, he compared the, the play that EMC is running to very much the play it ran with VMware. And as we all know, VMware is largely responsible for the majority of EMC's valuation, which has caused some irritation among some so-called activist investors. How are you going to get to that same play? And you're the former CEO of VMware, by the way. So right. <laughs> everybody got their scorecards. Um, it's kind of complicated, but, but explain to me how that play works. Well, it, it, the idea is to re repeat the play. I mean, when EMC acquired VMware, instead of integrating it back into EMC, they said to the VMware team, just lean into your opportunity, because Joe Tucci correctly realized that virtualization could be an even bigger opportunity than storage. So rather than trying to make virtualization the handmaiden of storage, <laughs> Uh, he said, run with that, that uh, model, and, and not only said, run with it, but work with my competitors, and you'll be allowed to monetize your success, so, which they did do by taking uh, VMware public, so VMware employees benefited from VMware stock. Right. 
And the model is the idea is the same here again, basically lean into this opportunity, be successful, even if it means working uh, with other infrastructure providers, and you'll have a, your own currency to reward and, and incent your employees. Mm -hmm. And eventually the plan is to take Pivotal public in the same way that the, VMware. That, no. that would be the final stage of the, of the play. How far along can, are you toward that now? Uh, we're not focused on that right now. We're just focused on, you know, I, I'm from the old school. I believe you first have to be successful right. before you go public. <laughs> so so, as a, so yeah, let's just... That let's, is old school. That, that, is, that is kind of old school. I yeah. appreciate that. Let's, let's gauge, I think... So nostalgic. <laughs> Joe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Joe gave a number that you're at somewhere in the ballpark of about a $300 million run right now. Yeah, we're, we're in transition because we brought in certain capabilities to build this company that we thought were going to be needed to really write this new generation of cloud independent but cloud oriented applications. Uh, so we took ingredients that came from a traditional enterprise, enterprise license, closed source model and have been transforming it into an open source and subscription model. And uh, we're just through that transforma uh, translation now. So although our revenues are about 300 million, within that 300 million, there's a new foundation of open source subscription-based revenue that is growing very strongly. You've got a strong software as a service business that right. has that recurring yeah. revenue model. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, so then how does it fit within the larger opportunity at EMC, a company that's kind of in transition right now? I mean, how does it... Well, the whole, the whole enterprise space is in transition, and uh, this was an explicit decision to say, look, when these transitions happen, uh, you can't just do it as business as usual. Uh, you've got to really have create a part of your company that can truly lean into the future. Mm -hmm. And this model is uh, one where you, you really set it up that way that uh, you create a group of people whose job it is not to protect legacy, uh, but to lean into the future. Mm -hmm. you know, the, and there's always a, a cost to doing that. Now you've got a separate entity, you have to manage it separately, et cetera. But uh, when these transitions are happening, History teaches us it's very different, difficult for legacy companies that have bred themselves into a certain culture that are getting the big revenue streams and profit streams from entities that are going to be hard to walk away from is that almost inevitably you don't lean into the opportunity the way you should. Mm -hmm. uh, Walt and I were talking about our you know, nostalgic days at, at Microsoft and you know the problem there was at Microsoft. You know, Microsoft built its first smartphone in 1999, but we always saw it as a handmaiden of the PC. Right. <laughs> you had this incredibly overwhelming success uh, uh, that no matter which way you looked, it was impossible not to see this as simply as a way to continue to support you know, that endeavor. <laughs> uh, and as a result, you know, we didn't capitalize on it, whereas uh, Apple had the courage when they got into, maybe because they hadn't, weren't the major winner, to really look at the iPhone as an independent experience, not as a Mac Jr. Uh, and these kind of cultural transitions are very hard to do, which is why this is kind of an interesting model of corporate governance. Speaking of transitions, and, and I get you, I, I'm sure you get asked this all the time, but Tucci is going to retire. Would you have any interest in replacing it? Uh, I'm very happy doing what I'm doing okay. right now. I've, I've always had a passion for applications and data. You don't want to run uh, the whole thing. Uh, is that a no, Paul? <laughs> uh, that is a statement that I'm very happy where I am. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough. Good enough. Why don't we, uh, why don't we go to questions? Uh, seems like a natural moment. Oh, there's Stuart Elsop Stuart. again. Yeah, I, 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 Paul. Hi, Paul. Hi, um, Dan. Okay. I'm fascinated by the program, actually, and I assume Eric's going to run the next session as well. But You've got three companies that are coming up on stage that are kind of the new thing in enterprise software. And what you're doing with Pivotal, with uh, agile development and training companies to do agile development, really is kind of the end game on the last process of building the SaaS infrastructure. And now people are focused on containerizing uh, applications and separating the, the logic and the data uh, and really creating a flexible infrastructure where um, you really can rent both the storage and the uh, application capability, and it feels to me like sort of Pivotal is the end game, you know, really starting with uh, uh, EMC and then VMware, and now with uh, Pivotal as a separate company. Um, it would seem to me that if it's Mary Barra or the CEO of another automobile company, the reason they're really terrified is they have no idea what Stripe, Slack, 
how's <laughs> how these things are going to affect their future and, and whether they even understand what these companies are doing. I fundamentally agree with that. Uh, the, the panic is coming from a realization that they're going to have to compete with companies who engage with the customer in fundamentally different ways. And the necessary uh, capability to engage with people is to understand how to do product development and technology in fundamentally different ways. All right, so what Pivotal is set up to do is to say, we can help you start that journey, and we can help you start it on top of a modern platform that has all the containerization and the other mumbo jumbo stuff built into it already so that you don't have to discover that on your own. You can kind of leapfrog all of that. We'll take you right to the stuff that really matters, which is how do you build business value, and we will along the way get you doing it on a modern platform that will scale into the future. Okay, well, Steve Wiles. Yeah, following on Stuart's question a little here, um, how important is it in building these systems that you're building for companies uh, to use open, <clears throat> open systems environments? Is that a big software deal or not? It, it is a big deal in the following sense. Uh, and first of all, as I said, we, we have completely aligned ourselves with open source. And where there wasn't an open source parade for us to join, we've, we've gone out and created it ourselves. So we've created the Cloud Foundry open source parade, for instance. The reason it's important is that open source has proven to be an incredibly effective way of building ecosystems. And when businesses look into the future, they know the foundations are changing. They know that the era of traditional client-server relational database is passing. Uh, they're not sure where to go, but when they look out, they see the biggest and most vibrant ecosystems being created around open source. So it's sort of almost ironical that over the last three or four years, uh, enterprises have gone from shunning open source to viewing open source as the safe choice. <laughs> the old way people said you didn't get fired for buying IBM, now you don't get fired for buying open source. <laughs> so open source is the way that ecosystems are built, and uh, e well-functioning ecosystems are incredibly powerful things. So businesses are realizing that and lining with it. They also like the fact that in theory, open source gives them an out. You know, they, it's the old thing, you know, fool me you know, once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. They look at how they got locked into vendors in previous eras and they're saying, I'd like to try and avoid that. So I like open source that in theory, if a vendor becomes abusive, uh, in theory I could go round up my colleagues in my industry and you know, we could go fund someone else to take this over. But lastly, and this is not important, is the software is free. <laughs> that, that's actually the last consideration in their minds. They're going on a very important journey here. They want partners to work with, but they want partners who have a different attitude and uh, who are trying to build more open ecosystems. I, I have one question, because I visited Pivotal and I noticed this is kind of interesting, and you see it, you see the developers hanging out in pairs. They work in pairs, they hang out in pairs. Can you explain what that's about? Yeah, it's, it, it, I, I've actually had to learn a lot uh, in the last couple of years because I, I was thinking you, you're gonna be, when you're gonna ask me the gender question or the diversity oh, yeah. question, we'll, but- uh, We'll get to that. I'm gonna ask I, you I, uh, what, what, what. I grew up in you know, Microsoft, other cultures where I like to say it was development by hero. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I use a more pejorative Sup term. Super developer. A more pejorative term than that. There was a, you know, elite of very high IQ, <laughs> abrasive people who kind of drove everything. Right. Uh, this world works very differently. It starts with the idea that modern development is a team sport, and if it's a team, then there's one rule for everybody on the team. And in our particular iteration of it, we work in pairs, and the reason is not about having one person check on the other. It's about basically information transfer and mentoring, because we typically pair junior and senior people together. It has the uh, great effect but because we rotate those pairings, change the pairings fairly often, people work on all parts of the system. So they understand how the pieces actually fit together. They make better decisions as a result of that. And it uh, requires us, because we change the pairings often, that there's no ownership of code. One module is never uniquely owned by one person, which requires you to write better code. <laughs> ah. uh, so when we took the Cloud Foundry project, which had been incubated under the hero model, and moved into this model, the team looked at the code and they, they made my hair stand on the head because they said, we're gonna rewrite all this code. 
we, we can't maintain this code and achieve the level of quality that we want. Uh, and uh, they've done that. It's also had the tremendous benefit of opening the environment up. Because now when we work with partners, we say, we don't just say, look, this is open source. Yeah, you can go download it if you want to. We say, come work with us. Come pair with us. Come and spend eight weeks. We'll pair you up with a variety of our developers. And you'll actually, that way, learn the living project, not just the code. So the diversity question. I know you're, you, you've said several times you're a two-year-old company, mm -hmm. but you're owned by or the majority of your stock comes from a much bigger company. Uh, so, so you have had to be thinking about this for a while. What is, how diverse are you and what is your plan to uh, get Well, I, I think the, the short answer is not enough. And uh, you know, I think collectively the high tech industry has not done a great job here. You know, we've paid lip service to it, but really, not really, you know, to, to use a phrase, leaned into this problem. Uh, on, on my visit, I saw a lot of guys, a yeah. lot of pairs of yeah. guys. So yeah. the, uh, one of the interesting things I'm trying to delve into now is this issue of culture. You know, this issue of culture, you know, development by hero, you know, people are admired because they pull all nighters, et cetera. Whereas this new culture, the Pivotal Labs culture, is a very different team oriented culture where if you're having to pull all nighters, that's a red flag. You stop, you're doing something wrong. Uh, you need to admit it. <laughs> and how does that? I don't know whether that is going to be more uh, uh, conducive to a broader variety of people. And I, I want to really delve into that to figure out what? if you change the culture, can you get, a, can you get people to uh, want to come and work in that environment, a broader variety of people to come and work well, in that environment? What percentage of your workforce now is female? We're probably in the de core development areas in the 10, 15 percent uh, area. Yes, that's pretty low. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, uh, LGBT and people of color? Uh, I don't know those actual statistics, uh, uh, but I'm trying to really sit, find out is if we are conscious about changing the culture, will that have an, uh, an effect? And then part of this whole modern agile movement is, is to be much more thoughtful and to do retrospectives. Uh, so we're going to start doing that and trying to say, what is it about our culture that is hindering greater diversity? So you're, you're just studying it, but I mean, you're not spending money on it or recruiting well, at different uh, colleges or some of the things well, some it, of the it, other the, folks have said. I'm fundamentally, you have to know what the root problem is. Otherwise, you're, you're just you know, putting Band-Aids on things. Okay. And uh, I, my permission is that people have been putting Band-Aids on this problem for 25 years now without measurable results. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Paul Moritz. Great. Thanks a lot. <laughs>